Let's all stand up. I'm all wired up. I'll stand up. Y'all repeat after me. These are the two most important hours of my week. These are the two most important hours. Of my week. Repeat with me. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I got Mr. Semantics over there. Ready? Repeat with me. These are <laughs> these are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish them. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one. Accept my worship, O oh Lord. Is God good? Amen. All right, ready? Let's go ahead and start singing. Y'all keep, y'all stay up here and keep right on. Let me see if I can get everything working here. Ooh. There it is. Is this working? Oh, yeah. Here we go. Here we are. Ready? Oh, it's glory, glory.
and he's healthy. That's awesome. You give Lord a hand clap for Walter. Awesome, awesome, Walter. Are you going to nickname him Dudley? <laughs> <laughs> That's God good. Amen. All right. Let's see here. Y'all ready? Let's, let's have some fun. Y'all ready to have some fun? Yes.
here in this area, the battle is getting more and more intense. And it really, I, I mean, this is one of those fancy King James words, but it behooves us to be ready. It behooves us to have our armor on and be ready for attack because Satan's doing all he can to snuff out the fire of God. But guess what? He didn't start it, and he can't, he can't put it out. Amen? Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap. He, he didn't start it, and he can't put it out. Right, here we go. Ready? Get your ready. Job. I begin with, I was kind of wondering how everything got kind of mixed up because Job was supposed to be last week in Revelation this week, but then it, then it dawned on me, September 11th. And I was very proud, you know, when they have those battles, the Army, Army, Navy, you know, uh, football games, I don't always necessarily get into the Army, Navy football games, but yesterday the Army football team did something that was very amazing. And I loved it. And I know you wouldn't think they would get flack for it, but in this nation that we live in now with all the crazy mess that's going on, they're going to get some flack for it. But you know what? When Army came out on the field, every player had an American flag and was flying it over their head as they came on the field. And they had three first responders with, with American flags. And they ran across the field with American flags in honor of September 11th and those that gave their lives and those that fought the good fight. I'm telling you, uh, I, that stuff like that makes me so proud. You know, the people can still stand up and know and do what's right. Get your Bible out. Turn to the book of Job. Some people call it the book of Job, but it's not the book of Job. That's the unemployment line. That's working at the book of Job. You're going to get plenty of employment in this one. <laughs> Stand for the reading of the words. You got your Bible say amen? I promise you that if you haven't already seen yourself in this, you will see yourself in this eventually. I promise you. Because every time I read the book of Job, I find myself in many different ways. <clears throat> I remember when I was, when Bethany was in the cancer center and Linda had this blood clot in her lungs. Uh, 
that they put a, Linda and Bethany both on the same floor so I could go to both of them. And the doctors for four days come to me and said, Mr. Linton, you could lose one or both of them at any time. And of course, one came home and the other one went home. Okay? And I remember as I was walking down the hall, I said, like Job, I said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I'm going to return. I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to curse you, Lord. You got this. I'm going to trust you 100%. And the doctor said, can I give you something? I said, I've already got something. I said, matter of fact, what I got, you can't write a prescription for. Amen. And so that, that, I think that was probably the, the closest that, at that time that I had felt like this. So let's see, the book of Job, chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz that his name was Job. And this man was a perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all, all the men in the, in the, in the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one this day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with him. And it was so when the days of feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered a burnt offering according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Again, remember now, this was, this was the Old Testament version of grace. Jesus had not died on the cross yet. And so this is actually, like I said, the Old Testament version of grace. And Job covered his family very powerfully. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going forth, going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? For there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered and said, Lord, does Job fear you for nothing? Has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house <clears throat> and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and the substance has increased in the land. But put forth your hand from now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Sounds to me like Satan's tried to hit him, but he couldn't. So he just said, hey, I can't even hit him. So why am I even going to try anymore? And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put forth not thy hand. So the Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses were feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. They that have slain the servants with the edge of the sword and I only am escaped alone till thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and have burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and carried them away, yea, and slain all the servants with the edge of the sword, and only I escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, he just keeps coming. Have you ever said, Here it goes, is it ever going to stop? And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Thy sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And only I escaped to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither, thither. And the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Again, chapter 2. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, And whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, As I considered my servant Job, for there is none like him in all the earth. A perfect and upright man, one that fears God 
and eschew with evil. And still he holds fast his integrity, although thou moves me against him to destroy him without cause. In other words, he stood up to the test. And look, he's still standing. Everything he had was taken away. And he's still standing. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is thine in thine hand, but save his life. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sore sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took a pot shed to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as a foolish woman speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Stretch forth your hands this way. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, that you have given us a very powerful, powerful testimony in your word. God, I know there's times in all of our lives when we feel like we've been tested beyond testing, feel like we've been stretched farther than we can stretch, feel like we have just been beaten and we can't take the beating anymore. But God, you have given us your word, and your word does not lie, and your word does not come back void. And Lord, we know, God, that you put Job in the Bible specifically for times when life has gone crazy and we're not sure even what to hold on to. I ask you right now, Lord, to help us to understand your word, your power, your authority and be strong when everything around us is falling to pieces. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, amen. amen, amen, amen. You can be seated. On the way down, tell somebody, if you're not here after what I'm here after, you'll be here after I'm gone. Say that. Everybody say it. There you go. Good. Now, a New York family bought a ranch out west where they intended to raise cattle. Friends came to visit and asked if the ranch had a name. Well, said the would-be cattleman, I wanted to call it the Bar J. My wife favored the Susie Q. One son liked the Flying W, and the other son wanted the Lazy Y. So we're calling it the Bar J, Susie Q, Flying Y, Lazy Y. He said, but where are all your cattle? He said, none of them survived the branding. <laughs> all right, I know. Burn the book. Well, I wanted that one today because, you know what, while, while we're trying to get everybody's different opinions about why we're going through what we're going through, and we're going to talk about that real shortly when we, we're taking Job slowly, like we're taking Revelation slowly, and, and you're going to find out that in a couple of weeks just how he got his advice from people that were supposed to be his friends and how they were helping him. But, but right now, we're, gonna, we're going to be talking about... Come on up here. There we go. Here it comes. It just took its time. It took its, there we go. We're talking about the storms of life out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. You know, uh, yesterday was a very powerful day. Uh, I did... Uh, I ministered... With some deaths, they had a funeral, uh, had some very, I mean, it was just a crazy mess early in the morning with somebody else that was needing some ministering to, and, and, and it was 9 11. And so, in between going in and out of the house trying to get things done and taken care of, uh, it was my, my father in law's birthday, we we're trying to take care of that too, and one of our neighbors died. It was just, you know, so much stuff was coming. And, and as all this was, was going, all I could think about again was this week, out of nowhere. And last night, because it's the 20th anniversary of 9-11, uh, and we should never forget it. And I didn't really think about it this way, but there, you know, we've got a whole generation that was not even alive during 9-11. And what I really hate is that some of this new stuff that's coming out trying to erase everything is going to erase that. And we can't let them because too many died and our nation was under a major attack. We watched some new footage last night 
on the History Channel, and it was some amazing, amazing stuff that we saw. But again, storms out of nowhere. So, so real quickly, I'm going to put some in here just to put us up for what we're at. And we're not even going to finish this one today. I'll finish it next time uh, about the, the second batch of trials. But remember, the, the very first trial, there's three great trials in the Bible. The first, of course, started in Gethsemane, and it was Jesus' trial. The second trial was of Abraham when he offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. And the third, of course, is Job, when, when, who was delivered into the hands of Satan. Now, now, of course, trials, many times they come out of nowhere. Trials, a lot of times, trials are described in the Greek as snares. And what is a snare? A snare is something that you deploy, that you put out when you're trying to trap animals that they can't see yet because it's camouflaged in the or in its surroundings and it's designed so you don't even see it until you're already being called up. And a lot of times in the Bible when you're talking about trials, that's exactly what it's talking about. Talking about a snare that is laid in such a way that you don't even see it until you become part of it, until it's got you. So, so trials, troubles, problems, persecutions, powerful pain, all these came to Job. And I thought about our own life and, and what's going on. And again, in this world you have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world, John 16, 33. So it's so out of nowhere, watch this now, just, just since 2020, life has come at us, wow, out of nowhere, of course, COVID-19, and there's been calamity uh, uh, like you've never seen before, and the, the economy's gone crazy. You go to gas, it's in the now, you're not even sure you can even gas at the gas station, you know, and... and I went to one of the gas stations just about a couple weeks ago, and I went to you. I like to get premium, and I went to go premium, and it was like 30 cent and stopped. And I didn't see any signs anywhere, so I tried again. Didn't get anywhere to stop. So I said, okay, well, let me try the middle grade. Then we went like 30 cent and stopped. And about that time, the person working at the store is walking by. And I said, ma'am, is there a problem? With the gas, she says, oh, we're out of gas. All we've got is regular. I said, do you think you could have told somebody that, put a sign out here or something? She said, we've been out all day. And I said, this is like 7, 8 o'clock at night. I said, don't you think you could have put a sign out here? Try not to be a smart aleck. She said, you could have put a sign out here to let us know this. I wouldn't even stop. And she said, I've just been too busy. She's standing right in front of me. She's out there with me, standing in the, right in front of the gas pump, and says she's been too busy to put a sign up saying, they didn't have any gas. I said, well, thank you, ma'am. And I got in my car, and I went and found the gas station that was actually open. And they didn't, they didn't see what was going on. But now, who would ever thought that now all this gas stuff we got going on? And you go to the grocery store, and things that used to always go by just like that, it's not even there anymore. And services that used to be rendered. It's just been calamity and catastrophes and all these earthquakes and storms. And, and if you look at the forecast, of course, there's more to come. And then yesterday. Yesterday, the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And I happened to be looking through some of the stuff, and I saw where some of the Hollywood celebrities and some of the very liberal, liberal people that want us to think nothing's ever wrong, there's always a conspiracy, said that those planes never really hit the towers. I saw it. I was reading it. Planes never hit the towers. That, that was just all put in there, added in to the footage, is that it was a conspiracy by the United States, that, you know, and they blew up the towers. And I said, how crazy can you be? You're sitting there watching the footage, the guys are talking, and the planes are coming in everywhere. You're getting told by, by, by the, the, the there was 5,000 planes in the air, and they all were told to ground right now, and they grounded 5,000 planes in no time. That was not a joke, and it was not some kind of optical illusion. Those planes hit those towers. And if, if, if certain people get their way, they're going to erase it from our history. Don't let it happen. We've got to remember this stuff so we don't go through it again. So think about 9-11 and all those people that lost their lives. And, that, and yesterday, I, I don't know if y'all have seen this or not, there were some documentaries on the History Channel, and they showed where the stewardesses, they actually, that the, you could hear the voices 
of the stewards talking back to the tower, trying to tell them what's going on. That we've been hijacked, and and somebody's been stabbed up in first class, and now they've gone into the gone into the cabin, and and they've killed the pilots. I mean, you can hear all this stuff going on, and and hearing all this stuff going on, and then they played a lot of phone calls. I bet they played 30 phone calls yesterday of saying, "I love you." And we're going to try to take the plane. Uh, please know that I love you if this doesn't work out. And all this stuff going on, it just brought it right fresh back in my heart again. And, and even when I went to go to sleep last night, I can think about, even after 20 years, how bad it makes me feel inside that we felt bad. And we cannot ever let those memories be erased. All right? So, so, so let's go back. I mean, I've done got off my soapbox now. Let's go over here. Uh, so let's keep on going. So discovers from chapter 1. This is where we were at last time. The ruler of the storm is God. The reason for the storm was Satan. And the reach of the storm was all that he possessed. And the reaction of the storm was praise. Wow. Think about it now. Think about the part. We just read it. The ruler of the storm is God. And Satan was the one that said, well, I... I there's no need to try and attack him. God said, did you consider my servant Job? And he goes, there's no need to mess with him. So here it is. So God's the ruler. Satan was the reason for the storm. And everything he had was taken away. And then his reaction was praise. Let me ask you a question. Have you been tried lately? Hard. And find it hard. Yes, sometimes it's hard to praise. But that's what the Bible says, the sacrifice of praise. That word sacrifice means to give something that you cannot afford to give. When I was up in that hospital, and I thought my wife and my daughter could die any time. I could lose both of them. But all I could think of is I'm going to praise God in spite of it. I'm going to praise God, and I'm going to trust Him in spite. So now, again, the reaction of the storm, when you have a storm come at you, you've got a choice. Everybody's got a choice. Everybody. Somebody say, look at somebody important and say, you've got a choice. And here's the choice. You can grow bitter or you can grow better. Amen? You can grow bitter or you can grow better. I'm telling you, the choice is yours, not Satan's. It's not even God's because God's not going to force it, and, and Satan can't make it happen. So I see this. He arose, which means to establish, to stand up again. All this information knocked him off his feet. And so he, he stood up again, and he watched this. Here's what he did. He ran his mantle and he shaved his head. That was an outward sign of mourning. If you look at the Hebrew, I want you to watch this. It said he stood up, and he reestablished himself from God. He started mourning, then he fell down. That word fell down means to be overthrown, overwhelmed. It means to die. So in the middle of this trial, he first establishes himself, I'm yours, God. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna curse you. I'm yours. But then he says, I'm still hurting. And so he does this morning. But then the next thing he does is he dies to self. When you find yourself overwhelmed, if you can't find a way to die to self, you'll find you cannot handle the major trials in your life. You have to learn, die to self. Then it said he worshiped, he fell down again, and he humbled himself, and he reverenced God, and he recognized God's sovereignty. And watch this, here it is. Here it is. And he said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return hither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. God is sovereign, and God is our source. Now, just when you thought you couldn't, well, it couldn't get any worse. Now I'm getting ready to knock on somebody's door. Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse. 
it got worse. Let me explain this with Bethany and Linda. We thought Bethany was getting better. Her last scan showed that there was some improvement. So because she had some improvement, Linda needed a surgery. They said, well, now that she's doing better and seeing improvement, let's go ahead and schedule this surgery. So Linda got the surgery. Linda's home from surgery. Bethany's home. Told not to go in the back by herself. She goes out in the back by herself after I told her not to. Walked on some steps. Fell over. Fell on her back and her head on the scene. In two steps. Can't move. Her head's hurting. We go get her. Winds up that the tumors had taken over since that last scan, and her back was eat up with cancer. And her back cracked in three places, and her brain started bleeding from the fall. Carried her to the to, to emergency room, and I said, Look, if she's got to go in the hospital, I don't want her here at Boca County. She's been at the cancer center. And he said, he said, well, we agree with you. He said, but she's so bad, we don't want her here anyway. She's got it here. Now, just a few weeks before, they said she's getting better. A carrier, Linda can't go anywhere. She's still suffering, not suffering, but healing. And she not, was told not to leave the house, not to drive. She's home, sitting home from her surgery. I take Bethany and think it's just going to be an overnight trip and I'm going to come back. Get there and they put her in intensive care. I mean, they put her in intensive care. They say she's got a massive brain bleed. And then they turn around and say, we need to do something. We need to work on her. So they're working on her. Within the next few days, they say, now we find out she's got three cracks in her back. So I'm thinking things, they're really getting bad. Now Bethany just starts going out. She's always had her mind. Now she's going out. She just starts staring in his face. And they're doing, using the knife, the laser knife in her brain, trying to get her brain back. And, and all this is going on. And then Linda calls and says, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. My chest hurts so bad. And I said, get Sam or somebody to take you to the emergency room. She goes to the emergency room. She goes to, goes to uh, one of those care centers. And they said, you need to go to the hospital. You've got blood clots. So I told her, she come to Greenville. She came to Greenville, and honestly, it got so bad in the emergency room. And I'm thinking, just when it was getting bad with death, and now here this comes. And they come in and said, you've got blood clots. We can't get them. Well, you know, this is bad. So they put her up on the same floor with Bethany. And I was thinking, honestly, the human part of me is saying, God, can it get any worse? And that time was the first time in my life I felt Job chapter 2. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, the doctor says, your wife could die. Another doctor says, your daughter could die. But again, this book gave me so much strength because it was during that time I did that. Of course, I didn't shave my head. Y'all can tell that. <laughs> but symbolically, I rose up and said, God, I'm going to trust you. And I, and I tried to keep a, a good outlook, but I, I said, God, help me die to me right now. Because I remember this, help me die to me right now. And I just worshiped God. And I walked back and forth from one end of the, one end of the hospital room or more uh, the, the, wall, the, the floor, I go from one end of the floor to the other end. Go check on one and go check on the other. Go check on one and go check on, on the other. So now, now watch this. The timing. Job's second set of trials came when he was already restless. His second set of trials came when he was already having to make readjustments. His second trial came when he already was having to rebuild all that he lost. Does this sound familiar? 
He's already trying to get everything right. He's already trying to get things back together. He's even trying to figure this out. He's trying to grasp his brain around what he has lost. And while he's grasping his brain around what he has lost, here comes round two. He doesn't have the Gospels. He doesn't even have Genesis, Exodus, none of that. All he's got is information that's been passed down, word of mouth, by God's people. He's not heard of grace. He doesn't know there's going to be a cross coming. He doesn't realize that Satan is the driving force. So he's restless. He's having to readjust. He's having to rebuild. And in the middle of all that, all that stuff that was coming, Job's world was about to crumble again. Am I telling some of y'all in here that's going to get worse? I'm not trying to tell you anything. But if it has got worse, today is your day for you to understand something and for you to get strong. Because God, we have the Gospels. We've got Genesis. We've got Exodus. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've got Revelation. We've got all this. We know about the cross. We know about the power of grace. We know about this stuff. We know about Satan and how he wants to take us down. And we know about God, how he wants us to stand up. Even it looks like we're going to go down. God wants us to rise up, just like that phoenix, out of the ashes and trust God that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. He's going to take care of you, even when it looks like he's not. Amen. We look around us right now in this world and see the whole world has gone crazy. Have you ever imagined a time... In 2019, would you have ever imagined all the stuff we see now? Can you imagine youngins being expelled from school because they ran on the field? This happened last year. Youngins ran on the field. One's young and his daddy was a first responder. The other young uh, uh, or EMT, the other and his daddy was a policeman, I think. And they ran on the ball field, a high school game carrying the first responder flag and they were suspended from school in the United States of America. Young is wearing U.S. flag shirts to school and expelled because they were inciting violence wearing a United States flag shirt in the United States of America. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, it got worse. But guess what? God's still the God of the storm. He's never let go. He's never relinquished his authority. He has never one time said, oops, how am I going to handle this? He knows in the stuff in your own life. Just like when Bethany and Linda were up on the floor. God already knew. And so what I said was God. And that's when I really, really learned how to climb in God's pocket. I said, God, this is honestly more than the brain can comprehend. But it's not more than you can comprehend. And I choose to trust you over feelings. And so I walk the hall and I say, naked I came from the Lord's womb, naked I shall return. I will not curse God. I know God's got a plan in all this and I'm going to trust Him. Even if I lose both of them, I'm going to trust you, God, because you're still in control. So now, so I see it. I'm just going to give you a little insight and then we're going to, we're going to close. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of what happened to Job at the time. Because I don't want, I want us to let things sink in. It's like Revelation, I want it to sink in. Watch this. Satan is continuously on the prowl. We see it in the first chapter. We see it in the second chapter. We see that he's always on the prowl, going to and from, to and from the earth, trying to find somebody to attack. He does it. We've got the book of Job. Job didn't have the book of Job. 
God was writing this book with Job's life. You know what I do funerals now? Here's what I'll say. They already preached their funeral before I got up here. I'm just going to tell you about their life. They've already preached it. Matter of fact, think about, <laughs> think about it. If I was going to have your funeral today, would I have to make up something? <laughs> no, I wouldn't make up something. I don't. <laughs> I don't preach people into heaven or hell. I just tell about their life, period. So everybody's preaching their own funeral while they live. All I do is I get to verbalize it after you die. That's it. Okay. So Satan is constantly on the prowl. What is he doing? He's searching for ways to intrude in your life. Did you know that? He wants to, he's looking for footholds, looking for doors to, to slip his little nasty foot in. And if he knows there's, there's, if he knows you're already having some problems with this, this, or this, he's gonna find ways to make it compound. Okay, so you got to remember something. He's always trying to find a way to intrude into your life. You see, when I learned in that cancer ward for the most awesome experience of climbing in God's pocket, you see, I knew that he wanted to weaken my trust in God. Right now we look around and see, and sometimes in some places, just being a Christian is like putting a target on your back. Being a patriot is like putting a target on your back. We cannot succumb to that. Amen? Amen. We are children of the Most High God. We serve a God that's got more power than any Taliban. We serve a God that's got more power than any woke movement. We serve a God that's got more power than any of this junk that's trying to tear everything apart. God is in control. It's time for the church to crawl in God's pocket and trust him one more time. Amen? Amen. Now's the time to trust him. Amen? Amen? Because he wants to ultimately destroy you. And if he destroys you and your testimony, then he thinks he weakens God. Wow. Wow. So I see this. Here's but. I love, I love when Satan's running his mouth and God goes, but. Although Satan is continuously on the prowl, God is continuously in control. He said, okay, you want to touch him? I'll pull the hedge down so you can touch him. But until he pulls the hedge down, you can't touch him. Amen? So watch. Watch this now. Satan still has to answer to him. Did you know that? Satan still says, yes, sir, boss. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, boss. Oh, he might make you think that he doesn't, but he does. Satan still answers to God. And I thank God for that. He still sets limits on Satan. He said, the first time he said you can touch everything he's got, but not his body. Now he says you can touch his body, but you can't take his life. God will not allow Satan to destroy you. Amen? You won't be destroyed. So watch this. I'm getting ready to close. And I'm, you're going to think I've lost my mind, but I'm getting ready to, that's okay. You already think that anyway. <laughs> you know it. Ready? Watch this. I'm going to tell you something about your trials. Ready? Get ready. Your storms are so sovereignly designed for your benefit. Whoa. Come on, preacher. Now you're, now, you're, now you're going off the deep end. No, I haven't. Satan couldn't do a thing to Job until God let him. So if Job, Job let him, I mean, if God let, Job, let Satan attack Job, he even told him, he put the parameters there. So, your storms are sovereignly designed for your benefit. 
Somebody say amen, please, because y'all ain't looking like you want to say amen. Ready? Now you got to do the sacrifice of praise and go, amen! <laughs> Storms promote an environment for spiritual growth. You know that over, I've been pastoring 30 years, and I've seen folks that would bear off to the left, or bear off to the right, or just fall off the road. And then something starts happening in their life, and they get back on the road. And they start pulling back in the middle of you. Amen? And you say, I sure wish they weren't going through that. But you know what? David said it was good for me that I was afflicted. Because it drew me back to you. And I had to get back to your word. Now I remember one time years ago, I watched this movie, and it was... Burt Reynolds and Don DeLuise, this crazy movie. And I think it was Burt Reynolds, his boat sank, and he was way out to sea. And so he's about to drown. He says, God, if you help me get back in, I'll give you 100%. He got a little closer. He could see that, see the shore, and he said, well, okay, God. Remember I said 100? How about 50? Then he gets a little bit closer where he can actually start putting his foot on the ground. He's still not there. He goes, okay, how about 25? And he starts walking up on the shore and he says, I'll get back with you later. That was funny back then. Not funny anymore. Because we all do that. God, you get me out of this? I promise you it won't happen again. I promise you I'll serve you with all my heart. You'll never have to wander again. I, well, you'll know where I'm at because I'll be right in your pocket. And then here it goes. Good stuff happens, just like in the book of Judges. Good stuff happens, they forget God. While they go down, they ask God. God sends a judge, they get up, going good. The judge dies, they go back down again, up and down, up and down. So it promotes an environment for spiritual growth. It also, storms help me refocus my attention toward God. Because if I get my eyes on the storm, when Peter was watching Jesus on the water, Matthew 14, he was doing the impossible. But when he started looking around and seeing the storm, he started sinking. Storms help us get our focus back, our attention on God. And then it draws me into a personal relationship with Christ. I can tell you, I remember some key moments in my life where God became more real than he ever had. The first was when my mama was sick and when she died. The second one was when, my, when Beverly was sick and she died. The next one was when Bethany first got in trouble. She gets out of trouble and then she gets sick. And it's looking bad. But instead of getting mad at God, it drew me closer to him. And just when I thought I was really close to God, then Linda with the blood drops in her lungs. And that's when I crawled in. Somebody said, how'd you preach Bethany's funeral? Number one, she asked me to. Number two, she had a dream and I saw it through her dream. But number three is, how'd I do it? Because I crawled. I was in God's pocket. Because humanly, I couldn't have done it. But I was in God's pocket. Yesterday, I was doing a funeral for a very bad situation. I won't go into it, but it was very, very bad. And somebody even asked me, how in the world did you handle that situation? And I said, I crawled and got Storms have taught me something. And that is, instead of getting angry at God, crawl in his pocket and watch what he will do. Let me go a little bit further. I'm going to give you some scripture. You know, some scripture, more scripture here. Go ahead. First, watch this. I, I just saw this. I thought it was so cool. God sends the storm to clear the path to the line. 
I remember I was in the woods when I lived on Possible Rock. I go to the woods to pray. And I had to walk through several fields, and there was just this little, little thing of woods that weren't very big, about big as the sanctuary. And I'd go jump the ditch, and I'd be around there, and I'd get on the other side, and I'd sit by, sit by the branch, and I'd sit down on the stump. And that's where I would talk to God. And I'd look at the trees, and I'd listen to God. And one day, out of nowhere, it was a very clear day, no clouds in the sky, and out of nowhere, the most harsh wind came through. I mean, it was so harsh that I had to bend my headband, and it started blowing in those trees. And tree limbs started falling down around me. And leaves were falling down. Branches and leaves. And when the storm was, it lasted for, I bet, 30 seconds. It felt like five minutes, but it was probably only 30 seconds. And when it quit, I was praying when it started. When it quit, I said, where'd that come from, God? He spoke to my spirit and said, me. And I said, why? And he said, look up. Before the storm, I could barely see the sun through the trees because of all the dead branches. After the storm, I could see the sun because the storm took out all the dead branches and all the dead leaves. And that was my beginning of learning that no matter how bad it gets, let trust God that when he sends the storm, he clears a path to the light. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, For our light, our momentary affliction, from this slight distress of the passing hour, is ever more and more abundantly preparing. Let me just stop right there. For our light, momentary affliction, that's the Greek. But if you were to take the King James Version, it's light affliction. Light affliction. And the person that wrote this knew pain because he had lost his sight being in prison. He had lost his sight. He had been stoned to the point that now he drug a leg and was paralyzed, partially paralyzed on one side. Spittle came from his mouth. This same man was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead. Had malaria, carried his own physician around with him everywhere. And he said, for this light affliction, he called it a light affliction. The word light affliction also in the Greek means, watch this, small push. All that stuff that man went through, Paul, and they caught all of it, a small push, the shipwrecks, being in prison, all that stuff he went through, a small push. And here in the Greek, here another part of the Greek, for our light, our light momentary affliction, this light distress of the passing hour, right now, right now, what you're going through right now, this passing, passing hour, it's going to pass. What you're going through right now is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations, a vast, transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. Wow. What you're going through right now, no matter how bad it seems, it's working something inside of you. After Mama's death, it changed the way I ministered. It changed the way I saw people. It changed everything. And I began, as I looked back, I began, I didn't thank God for losing my Mama, but I thanked God for the lessons I learned. And I thanked God for the way things had changed in my life. And I thanked Him for that. Then when Beverly got sick and died, I didn't thank God for her dying, but it changed my life again. And I thanked God. For the change. And then Bethany 
the four years of all we went through with her. I don't want her dead. I didn't want her in trouble, don't want her dead. I'd rather her be here with us. But I will not change. I would not change what I learned through that for anything. When I stood in that hospital and the doctor said, your wife or your daughter, just remember, they just come that morning and said, it got worse in Bethany. And then, when I didn't think it would get any worse, then my wife, the doctor says, you can lose either one of them. I do not want to go back to that moment. I don't want to have, have that moment again. But what I learned and the change inside of me, I would not take a million dollars for. Because it's at that point, God showed me. I'd been in his pocket before, but not that deep. He showed me something. And since that time, I found a calmer self that I never knew before until the trials and the storm pushed the stuff out of the way so I see the light. Everybody stand. We're going to talk about his trials next time. I'm not sure when that's going to be. It's probably going to be, uh, well, next time we do Job. <laughs> it may be the first of the month. It may not be. But we're going to do the Black Horse next week, the Revelation. I want to take our time, not rush through it, just like Revelation. This era that we live in has gone crazy. And it's so easy to get in your mind that God has taken his hand off and could care less. He definitely lowered the screen of protection. He's lowered it, but if he lowered it, he's controlling it. And it can't get but so far. But God wants us to crawl in His pocket. He wants us to step further into Him. I know God wants to bless us physically and I know God wants to bless us with abilities and God wants to bless us with things. But the biggest blessing in all is what happens on the inside. See, Job was losing everything on the outside. But God was building Job on the inside. If you feel like something's been snatched away, if you feel like something's gone crazy, if you feel like whatever, remember, Job, the outside was rough. But God was doing the work on the inside of Job. That Satan didn't understand. Nor his friends, nor Job himself. I promise you right now, the work God's doing in your life, you may not even understand. But God does. Let Him work. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I believe with all my heart they were soon going to see the king return. But I also believe before he returns, 
Some of us are going to have some of those just when you think it can't get any worse moments. And I know as a nation, we're beginning to have a lot of those just when you think it can't get any worse moments. Now's not the time to drop the ball or drop your faith in God. Now's the time to cling to Him and crawl in His pocket. I think I'll even do a sermon called How to Crawl in God's Pocket. Right now, with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here right now, and I'm going to get right down, I'm just get right down, cut it down to the root. You're here right now, and you've already experienced pain and heartache. And you thought that you were through with it. And now it's happening again. And Satan's tempting you into believing that God doesn't care. I can tell you with an assurance right now, that's a lie from hell. God very much cares. But God's working a work in you right now. This light affliction, this small push is doing something great. You just can't see it. If you're here right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, and you would say, Pastor, I, <laughs> that's me. I, I felt the pain. I, I felt the misery, the agony. And by the time I thought it was going to clear up, it got worse. And I'm really struggling. And I just need prayer. Nobody looking around, every eye closed. Could you slip that hand up? Just slip it up. You ain't got to keep it up. Lord, touch them right now. Touch them. Touch them all. Right now. We know, God, that you're in control. We know, God, that you got this. But maybe you're here and you're Faith is sure. But you're still having a struggle with the pain. And you're needing God just to bolster you one more time. I remember I was in a fountain power boat. And there's the seat. But you're going to stand up because the boat, what was going on in the boat and how fast you were going, you were trying to stand up so you could see and control stuff. And you just touched the side of that seat. And the seat would go down and you'd slide right into the arms and it would support you no matter how bad the boat went while you're standing when you're in those arms you're not going anywhere I was going 109 and it was so smooth because those things were around me those arms were around me You may be feeling bad right now, but if you can get in those arms and let them bolster you, you can stand the waves. You can stand the kickback. God's got this. Let's all pray together. Lord, I thank you for being you. I know, God, this life is not easy. And I know, Lord, this last year or so has gotten extremely hard. Father, first I ask you to touch the families that were personally affected 
by 9-11 that lost loved ones. I ask you, Lord, to touch our nation, to not let it happen again. And Lord, I ask you to help us be bolstered by you to climb in your pocket. And we thank you for it right now. Again, we rededicate ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And Father, I know you won't let us down. That's your promise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, Tuesday nights, we're talking about triggers. We, st we still didn't get through the first page. But that's okay, because we're taking our time. Like this Job, we're taking our time. Revelation, we're taking our time. Hey, we just mosey on the line. Y'all are like mosey on the line. y'all good. All the time. All the time. God is good. For a way we just miss the prayer place. Let's pray. Our Father God, is a privilege and honor to come in thy house and hear thy word spoken through our hearts and our minds, Father. Father, we thank you for keeping us close to your arms, Father. We thank you for the blessings that you have. We ask for continued blessings, Lord. Father, we ask you to bless the United States of America.